in this recording, we're going to examine the legislature. We're going to examine where the parliament sits in our system of governance. We're going to look at the legitimacy of the parliament itself. We're going to examine some of the historical aspects uh, to sort of demonstrate how we got to where we are. And then we're going to look briefly at the electoral process and how people get elected into the parliament. You may recall from earlier recordings the notion that th originally when we go back uh, a few thousand years to say the Norman conquest there was no really uh, no separation of powers and what we see uh, exist in our system these days. Essentially the legislature and the judiciary came later. Originally there was only the executive. It was the king and the king uh, I guess who controls the army really has the power to rule arbitrarily across the land. And so in the early days or early years and um, centuries post the Norman Conquest, this idea that the king is, uh, is absolute and all powerful um, was mapped out. Now the difficulty is, of course, that the king can't, um, you know, while all power is vested in him, he can't be everywhere on the land with his army at all times. And so there's this process of delegation um, whereby the king would grant areas to the various barons to essentially look after. And those areas themselves are too large. And so that those barons would um, sub-delegate, sub-contract to some extent, their um, the rights to govern small areas into, into earls and, um, and knighthoods. And th this process, this, this hierarchical system of subfeudinating the land is really where we draw this notion of the, the feudal system, the feudal doctrine from. Um, the idea is though that the barons at the top still owe fealty to the king, to the monarch uh, himself. Now this absolute power of the king to, uh, to essentially rule across the land and to have absolute arbitrary and discretionary power to do things to, uh, to his subjects uh, is through the, I guess, the history of, um, uh, of Britain and of later of Australia, the, this, this absolute power was limited. Uh, and that really, when we look at the history, really started in 1215 with the signing of the Magna Carta. Uh, at that time, the collection of nobles came together, they essentially shirt fronted the king and said that the, even the king himself is still subject to the same law as everyone else. Now at this time, this limiting of what the king could do was really, really limited in terms of what the king could do to those you know, directly beneath him in that hierarchy, to the various barons who made up this this council, this group that was known as the parliament. Now, it wasn't until a few hundred years after the Magna Carta where these um, this concept of of having two groups, where you would have a, a group who would represent uh, the nobility in advising the king, which was known as the House of Lords, and another developed, which was one representing the commoners, common people. And really these two houses, um, they were really fundamentally just advisory body bodies, bodies. They give um, uh, advice to the king, but they really have no direct power to control uh, what the king can do. And again, over time, the power of the parliament increased. Uh, some examples being during the reign of Henry VIII, where there was famous disputes between the, the king and parliament in terms of what he could and couldn't do. And then uh, another uh, important year that we've certainly looked at in early recordings, in 1689, when the Bill of Rights was created, whereby a pair of Dutch royals were installed as the monarchs of England. And really that particular point in time is a, is a fundamental um, turning point in moving away from an absolute monarchy into what we really consider to be a constitutional monarchy. And this doctrine uh, that we uh, ascribe to our system these days of parliamentary supremacy really starts to uh, arise from that point. That's where the king has little arbitrary power to rule and in fact the rules, the laws, the statutes start to be generated through the Houses of Parliament. By the time the first fleet sailed 
and arrived in Botany Bay in 1788, the systems of parliamentary uh, processes and this idea of parliamentary supremacy were actually well established in the United Kingdom. However, as Australia was founded as a, a essentially a penal colony, they weren't immediately implemented. In other words, that there wasn't a parliamentary body created in the colony of New South Wales. That didn't come until uh, quite some years later in the first parliament in New South Wales sat in 1823. It is important to note as well that the system of parliamentary uh, democracy as it uh, was expressed in the colony of New South Wales and then later to the uh, other colonies and territories and states after Federation is very much based on the Westminster system. This idea that the model of the British systems uh, of Parliament were essentially copied and pasted all around the colonies of the British Empire in the 1800s. So some features of the British system, the Westminster system, um, include firstly and foremostly the idea that it's a, a popularly elected parliament. People vote and the people that they vote for in whatever system represent uh, constituents in this small group of people that meet in the various parliament houses. The system is what's known as bicameral, in other words having two houses usually one larger house of, of re representatives that are voted and, and, uh, and having an upper house as well which may be either directly voted by the people or appointed uh, through some other system. I will note though that not all uh, parliamentary systems do have uh, bicameral parliament. So for example in Queensland in the territories, the ACT and the Northern Territory and New Zealand there is no upper house it's only this lower House of Representatives in the model. And I'll talk in more about the Queensland system in more depth uh, shortly. Another important feature is really the role of political parties, and in particular, uh, I think an important uh, system that we have, that the British, uh, British Empire and its um, essentially system of, of installing the Westminster system around the globe, has actually, in, in many ways, instilled this idea of having oppositions, loud vocal groups who form who are formed in the minority who aren't in government whose role essentially by convention is to criticize the government of the day and so political parties themselves actually form an important um, component of our system of governance that idea that uh, a collection of people voted for in the parliament can usually petition the governor or gov governor general in order to form the government of the day, whereas those that that can't, that are in the minority, form this opposition. Now from time to time, particularly when the uh, votes between the two major parties is close, minor parties uh, can often sit and act as the sort of the balance of power. Uh, certainly in systems using proportional voting, such as New Zealand, it's not at all uncommon for one party to not be able to secure uh, a majority in the in the in the Houses of Parliament. So as a result, coalitions can sometimes be formed or parties can sit on the crossbenches. In other words, in some issues they vote with the government, in some issues they vote against the government. And in many ways this is a useful uh, tool in itself in that it keeps the government of the day accountable. The government can't necessarily pass very, very unpopular measures if they can't get the support of those crossbench MPs and minor parties. Now, another aspect of this uh, Westminster system that is uh, transplanted around the globe by the British is that there is little separation of powers between the legislature and the executive. In fact, all heads of the various uh, arms of the executive, barring the uh, governor or governor general, are actually MPs or senators themselves. In other words, they are, are already in the legislative body and then they form uh, the heads of each of the ministries. Now in some other systems and most notably in the United States they enforce a strict separation of powers and that is that a person can't sit in both at once. Uh, an example of this was uh, Hillary Clinton in order to become Barack Obama's Secretary of State had to resign her senatorial position. She was a senator in New York, she had to resign that in order to take up 
that role in the executive arm of government. In the Westminster system, though, we, we kind of accept that the uh, the lawmaking um, function is inherently political, and so just in our system, it's not deemed to be quite so problematic. Uh, that there's sort of an outcry about um, essentially people sitting in two roles at the same time. Another really important feature of our Westminster system are all the rules, customs and conventions that were transplanted from the British system into our own. So for example, the uh, principle of parliamentary privilege, the idea that a person can speak openly and frankly in parliamentary debates without fear of any form of legal repercussions. There's no uh, mechanism to sue someone, for example, for defamation, for things that are said inside um, debates, parliamentary debates. Also, there is a, a comprehensive detailed record of parliamentary debates and the minutes from each of the uh, committees that are assigned um, by Parliament in order to examine um, bills and legislation. Um, another role which uh, is very much founded in convention is that of the Speaker of the House, uh, a person usually but not always from the majority uh, party, from the government of the day, whose job is essentially to over oversee the debate inside Parliament and the Speaker has uh, certain powers to evict members who would get too rowdy. Now the Speaker, even though she or he is clearly from um, one of the political parties uh, is still by convention uh, not supposed to take uh, take sides in any of the debates. They're supposed to act in some ways as by convention as some form of impartial arbiter, a person who oversees the structure of the Parliament uh, House itself throughout the, um, the sessions of debate. Australia has a federal system. What that means is that there are a collection of states that used to be colonies they decided to come together, create an extra level, level or layer of government, and to express the power of each of the states and this new federal government in a document which we call the Australian Constitution. So the, the Constitution really uh, is referred to as a what's known as a federal compact, and it uh, devotes a, a lot, many of the sections, in terms of how the federal government is structured. So that the, the Parliament, the federal parliament, uh, and how it's set up is set out in chapter one. And that says uh, pretty simply that there is the Queen's representative, who's the Governor General, who's part of the executive. There is uh, a Senate, an upper house of review, and there is a lower house, a house of representatives. Now fundamentally the two houses uh, represent, sort of represent two different constituencies. The House of Representatives is the People's House. It's comprised of 150 members, one from each of the federal electorates. Uh, so for example Herbert, where um, I'm sitting right now. Each of these members are elected for a term of three years. And those members are elected to represent their particular um, region, their district. And also, the House of Representatives uh, really dictates who the government of the day is going to be. Why? Because it's the majority of persons, uh, representatives in the House of Reps, that can form the government. In contrast with the House of Representatives, the Senate is not designed to represent people in individual districts. It's really about representing the states themselves. You see, when the various colonies were coming together and debating uh, how this incoming, this new federal structure was going to work. There were some real and genuine fears that the dominant uh, colonies, so largely New South Wales and Victoria, would be able to dictate terms to all of the other colonies on the Australian mainland and Tasmania. And so that the Senate and its role fundamentally was really about representing the states themselves. Each of the states, in fact, has the same number of senators. There are 12 per state. And fundamentally, it was about protecting the rights of those particular states. Now, what happened though, uh, over, really over time, is that rather than representing the states themselves, the Senate tends to really just reflect political parties 
And so this original idea of protecting the states uh, themselves really has largely fallen by the wayside. Um, also note that the territories have representation in the Senate as well. There are two senators from the ACT and from the Northern Territory. So that the, there are 76 members in the Senate. And fundamentally, the role of the Senate is really to, um, to examine bills, most of which come through the lower house. They come through the House of Representatives and are sent to the Senate in order for them to uh, either uh, pass, you know, accept that particular bill, or to reject it, either in entirety or to um, uh, amend it, or from time to time to hold inquiries and hearings. Now, uh, there are some types of, specific types of bills, revenue bills, taxation um, statutes, that can only be passed through the lower house, can only come in the House of Representatives, and it is only sent to the Senate, and the Senate can't make changes. They can either say yay or nay. And, as we've discovered in uh, 2016 when this recording was made, from time to time the Senate will reject a bill. Now the uh, Constitution uh, allows for this and it allows the lower house, um, usually the government of the day, to go back, look at the legislation and if they don't want to make substantial changes to it, they can send it back up to the Senate again. And if the Senate rejects it for a second time, the, um, the government can actually request the Governor-General dissolve both houses of Parliament and they go to the polls. And so this, we have this term, the double, delusion, double dissolution uh, election. And that's really occurring from the, the government being able to pass legislation through the Senate. And of course, the third uh, aspect to the federal government is the monarch so that the Constitution uh, establishes the Governor-General as the Queen's representative in uh, the federal system of Australia. In each of the states, the uh, this equivalent role is that of the Governor. Now, if someone was to read the Australian Constitution without any knowledge of context uh, and history, you would expect that the Governor would have a host of powers because in the Constitution, uh, the Governor, or Governor-General for the federal um, uh, government is given uh, a whole range and variety of powers. However, by convention, the Governor-General in the federal system and the Governors in the states actually do very, very little. Their role, predominantly, and by convention, is to assent to legislation. So while a cursory read of the Constitution may, it may suggest that, oh, it's the role of the uh, Governor-General to, um, to enter into treaties, to declare war on other nations. In reality, it's the government of the day. The Governor-General will, will uh, follow reasonable directions of the government. Um, there was one particularly famous time in Australian political history in the mid-70s when the Governor-General of the day did, in fact, decide to exercise some of this you know, traditionally unused power. Then the opposition leader, Mr Fraser, decided to use his numbers in the Senate to block supply, to force a general election. Mr Whitlam refused to call for a double dissolution. His government should stay in office because of its majority in the lower house. Neither leader would back down. So must Sir John Kerr accept your advice, whatever advice you give? Unquestionably. The Governor-General takes the advice from his Prime Minister and from no one else. And must act on that advice? Unquestionably, the Governor-General must act on the advice of his Prime Minister. There is no tolerance here, he must None do. None whatever. And then came Remembrance Day, November the 11th, 1975. After meetings with both leaders, the Governor-General announced that he was dismissing Mr Whitlam and appointing Mr Fraser as caretaker Prime Minister until a general election decided the issue. An angry Mr. Whitlam responded to his sacking in a speech on the steps of Parliament House. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. The proclamation which you have just heard read by the Governor-General's official secretary 
was countersigned Malcolm Fraser. So I'll turn now to the state legislature. Now, in the state of Queensland, uh, or originally the colony of Queensland, uh, again, the British system of having an upper and a lower house were transplanted into the colony. With the lower house, the legislative assembly, uh, really resembling the House of Commons in the United Kingdom. Queensland presently has 89 districts, each with one representative. Uh, some legislation was tabled earlier in 2016 in order to increase that to 93. And essentially each MP, although the vast majority of which uh, have affiliation to a particular political party, uh, are, you know, at least ostensibly, there to represent the people of their particular district. Originally there was an upper house, a house of review known as the Legislative Council. Um, that had a, a small number of people and representatives in the Legislative Council were actually appointed by the government of the day. And this was somewhat problematic because the decisions were therefore uh, wholly political. There were large-scale problems with people, particularly in the early days, who weren't even resident in Queensland, so, um, people that may have had a connection to the, the then colony, uh, but then they would uh, generally reside back in England. So as a result, they really weren't seen as very representative of the people that, uh, that essentially they were supposed to be serving. And because they weren't in the state, they weren't even really effectively uh, working as a house of review either. So as a result, uh, in 1921, the Labour Party uh, actually appointed a, a host of people to the Legislative Council who then voted themselves out of existence. They were, uh, I guess, affectionately known as the Suicide Squad. And so Queensland went from being bicameral to unicameral. Now, the, the physical house still exists, it's still maintained. It's, uh, you can view it if you happen to visit Parliament House in Brisbane. But it's uh, essentially ceased to exist as a, um, a mechanism in the Queensland parliamentary system. I'm going to talk briefly uh, now about local government. Now local government isn't recognised in the constitutional arrangements between state and federal governments and a very little bit is actually recognised in the constitutions of the various uh, states and territories. Instead though, uh, local governments uh, are essentially each of them are creatures of statute. They're given legal personality and given uh, a wide host of powers under the various local government acts. Now Townsville has uh, 10 councillors that represent 10 different districts in the city plus the mayor uh, herself. I think there's a few things to be noted about uh, the role of local councils. The first one uh, primarily in our system of governance is that the each of the councils is a creature of statute and the state government gives powers for councils to usually through this uh, system of delegated le legislation to um, to do things and create policies for their particular region and to be able to enforce uh, certain statewide laws in that area as well. Uh, but when there's a clash between uh, councils and the state government, uh, at the end of the day, the councils are creatures of statute. The state government giveth and the state government taketh away, as was the case in Townsville and Thurngawa in 2007-2008. What happened there? Well, the state government, uh, to reduce administrative um, costs, they simply abolished certain councils. They just removed some and merged them with others. And really the important thing to note is that there's very, very little each of those councils that were going to cease to exist could do about it. And so I'm going to turn now to the process of actually electing people to the various parliaments, the systems of election that we have. We're going to look at who can vote, who can be voted for, and really the the role of our electoral system in achieving uh, some form of uh, legitimate government. <laughs> 
And so we're in, when we're examining who can vote and this idea of having universal suffrage, uh, it has to be said from the outset that this is actually a relatively recent phenomenon. So it can be helpful here to give this some historic context. And if we go all the way back to 1066 and the Norman Conquest, um, no one has any rights. Nobody votes for any of the people that conquer them. The, all of the power of the state is vested in the king. And the king, again, as I've uh, mentioned, outsources some of those function to, to barons, and they look after each of the various regions. And there is this hierarchy that goes all the way down to the, uh, to the subjects, the people, the serfs, tilling the soil. Now they don't get to vote. Each of the people living on the land are essentially just subjects. They're born and live their lives owing fealty to the next person uh, above them in the hierarchy. In fact, the concept of citizenship, uh, that didn't come for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But, as uh, I've earlier alluded to, the Magna Carta in 1215 did reduce some absolute power uh, of the king to, to really be able to control the various barons. The king became subject to the law to some extent. Still, though, that's not about the suffrage of, of the people, the serfs, the people on the land. The Magna Carta was really talking about, well, they used the phrase, free men. Uh, and the number, of, I guess, the percentage of people who were free in that sense uh, was very, very, very small. Generally, in fact, they refer to people who have land. And this concept of people who are landed, the landed gentry, having um, a say in the political process is a theme that continued throughout uh, the history of of England and subsequently in Australia as well. So for example in the colony of New South Wales the first sort of free elections in order to vote you had to be uh, a man, you had to have uh, either a freehold at the state valued at 200 pounds which of course was a massive massive sum of money back in the mid 1800s or to be paying a rent of 20 pounds per year. Now a few decades later in the uh, mid 1850s the right to vote was extended to all uh, adult males regardless of land holdings but specifically excluded indigenous people as they weren't recognized as British subjects. Now, in terms of the rights of women to vote uh, South Australia was the first of the colonies in 1895 Queensland was was quite late in the piece it wasn't for another 10 years in 1905 that women were out to vote, and another 10 years after that, before they had the right to stand for Parliament. Now, Indigenous Australians weren't given uh, the right to vote in Queensland until 1965. Now, when we think about uh, those two later dates, that idea that women in Queensland couldn't vote till 1905 and Indigenous people till 1965, we say, well, don't we have constitutional rights to vote? Surely the creation of the federal government would establish procedures and give people the power to do that. And well, to be to be frank, largely no. The Australian Constitution, uh, the voting component is, is expressed in very broad terms that people in the Senate and the House of Reps shall be composed of members directly chosen by people of the Commonwealth. And the High Court uh, from time to time has had to uh, to examine those clauses and, and really to, to sort of flesh out what uh, what it is that they mean. Um, and the first case on the slide there is uh, Langer in the Commonwealth. Now, one thing about Australian uh, electoral systems is that relative to voting systems at pretty much everywhere in the world, Australian systems for voting are very complex. As an example uh, of this, um, Myself and the most recent federal election decided that I would rank, as is my right as an elector, rank each of the uh, candidates for the Senate in the state of Queensland in preference, this idea of preference voting. Uh, and so I filled in the form to the best of my ability, ranking each of the candidates for the Senate from number one all the way up to candidate number 120 
Now that sounds somewhat ridiculous on the face of it, and certainly that was uh, part of the argument that Mr Langer raised, that look, encouraging people to just uh, tick or number just one and then rank all of the others equally because uh, we really don't care. That's my expression of preference in terms of political candidates. Um, that was certainly his argument. Now the difficulty was that doing it and actually encouraging people to vote in an incorrect manner was actually a criminal offence. And you would think the High Court would have been particularly sympathetic towards this, that voting is this um, a great expression of the individual and it's, uh, I guess, one of the most important uh, acts that we can take as a, I guess, to represent our personal liberty in, and in maintaining the integrity of our system. However, they said, and this is a, actually a pretty common theme amongst electoral cases that have been to the High Court, they actually said, no, look, the Australian Constitution doesn't actually establish individual civil rights. It's very, very light on that sort of detail. It doesn't actually give a specific right to individuals to vote at all. It just says that the people, as a class or category, elect the members of parliament. It's not about the individual express wishes or, de or desires of individual citizens uh, electing members. Similarly, in uh, uh, King Jones, uh, the state of South Australia had actually lowered their ages for voting for their um, their members of parliament. However, at the time, federal parliament still required adults to be 21 years of age. And so there, uh, Ms King en uh, was an enrolled uh, voter and went to vote in the Commonwealth election and that was refused. That went to the High Court and again, they said, look, no, the federal compact that is our constitution is not actually about constitutional uh, rights for the individual. It's merely a statement that the system as a whole has to be voted by the people. The Commonwealth Government actually can create uh, legislation that you know, can actually exclude people from voting. Now as a resolution to this, uh, each of the states and territories and the Federal Government itself later on passed legislation. Uh, so these days the, um, the adult suffrage is, is 18 years old. So I've explained that the Australian Constitution doesn't really establish much of a framework for individual voter rights and suffrage. So instead of having these in the Constitution, the federal government has really taken upon themselves to map out who can vote and who can't vote. And those rules are contained in the Commonwealth Electoral Act uh, 1918, and they're pretty straightforward people allowed to vote are everybody over the age of 18 who is an Australian citizen. Also, British citizens who prior to some changes in the mid-80s were already on an electoral roll uh, retain that right to vote. So at its very uh, basic level, uh, suffrage is pretty straightforward. You have to be an Australian citizen and you have to be over the age of 18. However, there are some exceptions to that. For example, people who are, uh, have an infirm mind and can't understand the nature and significance of voting, uh, persons who have been convicted of treason, in other words, trying to over overthrow the, either the state or federal governments, and more controversially, people who are serving sentences, so who are currently in prison of three years or longer, can't vote in elections either. Now, while these are quite strict legal barriers to voting, there are also some other uh, practical barriers that can prevent people uh, living in very rural or remote areas, uh, having some form of physical uh, disability uh, to, that may, may not impede the, um, your access to voting and voting boots. Um, there's uh, some research to suggest that Indigenous uh, people and people living in Indigenous communities uh, don't have the, um, the same ability or uh, level of engagement with the voting process. And also because uh, from practical consideration a person has to be on an electoral roll and specify an address within a particular district, uh, people who are homeless and or at risk of homelessness uh, can 
have uh, that as a, a very significant barrier in order for, um, for them to be on a roll and then subsequently to vote. Another interesting thing to consider in the Australian context is that, and it's quite uh, unusual, very few countries have this, the idea that voting is actually mandatory, it's an offence to not vote, or at least to not turn up to the uh, electoral booth on the day and or cast uh, a postal vote. And it's something uh, that's deba been debated for a very long time, but Australian, um, the Australian uh, electoral system has had compulsory voting for, um, for about 100 years, and it does form part of the Australian, um, I guess, the political context. There have been many cases that have gone um, both through the intermediate and all the way to the to the High Court to analyse whether or not the uh, I guess the Parliament can legislate to make uh, voting compulsory. And uh, the overwhelming uh, response from the the courts has been, well, yes, actually you can. One of the uh, I guess most self evident features of compulsory voting is that voter turnout in Australia is very, very high. About 95% of people do turn out and vote in federal elections. And this compares obviously very favourably to uh, similar jurisdictions overseas where you get about two thirds of people in the UK and a little bit over, over half for the US presidential elections. And so uh, there is debate both ways as to the merits of having compulsory as opposed to non-compulsory system. Um, all that can really be expressed um, is that Australia has had compulsory voting for such a long time, it very much forms part of the culture. It's seen as not just a civic duty that you do to be uh, a good person and to express your um, participation in civic society, but also as an actual duty, a legal duty that um, you receive some form of sanction if you don't take part. Now earlier I noted that the lower house in federal parliament, the House of Representatives, essentially represents the people of a particular area or district. One of the challenges though is trying to determine uh, how these areas are actually established and set out and how many people or to be in any particular electorate. And this is, um, it's a very classically Australian problem because uh, as we're aware, some regions of Australia, uh, you know, the, the southeast of Queensland um, and in and around uh, the greater Sydney area and in Victoria, there's a high density of people in quite a small amount of space. Whereas 97% you know, of Australia is uh, essentially either uninhabited or has a very low population density. And so this principle that we uh, that we have that I, I guess flows from the rule of law, that idea of you know, each is equal before the law and we're all considered equal as citizens, the challenge there is that well when we're trying to determine electoral boundaries how do we go about making these things equal? And again I should reiterate the Constitution is is not particularly specific about how the process of electing is to be done. It merely states in broad terms that the lower house of parliament shall be uh, directly represented and voted for by the people. And so uh, since you know, post-federation, the federal government uh, would have legislation and, and or rules that would set about uh, determining the size and geographic boundaries of electorates. And importantly, electorates should be uh, population-wise equivalent. Now, in the mid-70s, uh, there were some uh, some electors uh, sort of objected to this, and three matters were heard by the High Court in uh, in 1975. And the uh, uh, the High Court bench gave uh, separate reasons. Uh, I believe that there's five separate judgments that were issued. And essentially, uh, they said that, look, in relation to how pop Parliament goes about setting these boundaries, whereby they try to have, after looking at the census data, electorates that represent um, an equivalent number of people. So essentially, the population of Australia divided by uh, 150, and to have those electorates to be plus or minus 10%. And the High Court said, uh, in response to some challenges to this, where things hadn't been done 
yeah, particularly close to that. Really, honest effort, ref. In other words, the Parliament clearly had mapped out the intent to make it uh, each electorate approximately the same size. But in terms of practical considerations, it's almost impossible to actually make it make them identical. And so that a reasonable attempt in order to do that was going to be sufficient. Now, interestingly, this, this equivalent constitutional requirement wasn't uh, the case or situation in the states. And so the, this practice, um, what's known, has been known for the last few hundred years as gerrymandering, whereby the government of the day would redistribute electoral boundaries, you know, really to try and suit themselves in terms of getting re-elected. So curiously in Queensland, originally this uh, idea of having one person, one vote and having them plus or minus, uh, in Queensland it was 30% as opposed to the federal government's 10%, was the accepted norm and certainly had been uh, up until just after the Second World War. Um, interestingly, the Labour Party of the time in the late 40s and early 50s uh, took it upon themselves to redistribute it in order to give um, essentially some, uh, I, I guess, more recognition from people who were a long way from Brisbane. And the, uh, I guess, the, the underlying reason for that was that at the time the Labour Party would, was very popular in the provinces. Uh, however, what happened, um, sort of a shift over the 60s and 70s was that the uh, the country party who was um, led for a long time by Joe Bjerke Peterson who ended up being Premier, the country party uh, would draw its support from the regions and Labour uh, sort of after the 50s really started to draw most of its support from the, uh, the inner uh, Brisbane suburbs. Now once the uh, Joe Berkey Peterson was in power uh, and his, his country party in coalition with the Liberal Party set about uh, redesigning electoral boundaries to take uh, into account that they had a lot of grassroots support in regional areas. And so when looking at the uh, elections in the 70s, the country party would sort of win uh, less than 20% of the vote, but would end up with a, sort of a third of the seats in Parliament. And really, it's important to note because it's the government of the day systematically undermining the electoral uh, process in quite an underhand and unfair sort of a way. So we've looked at who can vote in elections. Now I'm just going to turn to the uh, more vexing issue of who can be elected. In other words, who can we vote for? Now, this is expressed in two places. The first on the slide is the Commonwealth Electoral Act, where it simply states that a person has to be on an electoral roll and an Australian citizen. So just make note that the earlier um, uh, voting rules that British citizens prior to 1984 uh, can still vote, but they can't run for, for Parliament, either in the Senate or the House of Representatives. Now the trickier one is the constitutional requirement. Section 44 of the Australian Constitution gives and lists a, uh, a series of features that will either prevent somebody from running for office or uh, disqualify them if they were already uh, elected to Parliament. Uh, now the first and most interesting one is allegiance to foreign powers. Now the uh, most significant um, instance where this comes up, people who are dual citizens cannot run for or remain in the federal parliament. The next two are quite straightforward. Uh, treason against either one of the states or of the commonwealth uh, will preclude you from running for office, uh, as will being an undischarged bankrupt. Notice that a person who's discharged bankruptcy after the standard period, usually three years, can run for for the Senate or the House of Representatives at a later stage. Now, as an interesting example of separation of powers, a person can't run for Parliament if she or he holds an office uh, under any government department or has some form of pecuniary interest uh, with the public. In other words, has some interest in, in an organisation which may have 
uh, often contracts with the federal government. Now, even in the uh, early days when they were doing the constitutional debates, they realised that could be problematic with large organisations. And so there is the stipulation, uh, companies with more than 25 uh, members, you can have an interest in those. And that really prevents uh, members of parliament and people running for parliament in owning or investing shares in large organisations, many of which do deal with the government in some capacity. Two examples where Section 44 uh, was discussed and debated by the High Court. Uh, the first is Sykes and Cleary. Um, there, Mr Cleary won an election in Victoria and one of the other candidates, not the second, third or fourth candidate behind Mr Cleary, but uh, somebody who gathered about 300 votes in that election, uh, disputed this. Um, and the reason, the argument that he went to the High Court for was that Cleary was at the time engaged as a teacher and he had taken leave without pay. He was a teacher in Victoria. And so Mr Sykes took to this High Court and actually won. There the, the High Court did say, look, that does constitute being in office under the Crown. And so subsequently what the states and the federal government have done in their legislation is to basically when people who are employed in those agencies now decide to run for parliament they do so without pay but and they're terminated their roles actually terminated but by default they will be rehired if that person is unsuccessful in, um, in obtaining office. Now the second case here involves um, a successful Senate candidate, uh, Heather Hill, who had won in the um, 99 election, had won a seat in the Federal Senate. There, the difficulty that she had is that she was a dual citizen. She was actually a British national. And uh, after the election, sort of a, a few weeks after when this was discovered and um, and there was sort of this fear that this was going to go to court as a result. She immediately renounced her British citizenship. Uh, but the, the High Court said, no, actually, it doesn't matter. At the time you went into the election, you were subject to uh, a foreign power within the meaning of Section 44 of the Constitution. And unlike in Sykes and Cleary, in that situation where the entire election or by-election was deemed to be invalid, in Sue against Hill, because it was a Senate position, the will of the people was still expressed uh, in terms of the proportional system. And so the next person in the party list uh, took their um, Ms. Hill's seat. The next thing to look at in this recording is the electoral system itself. So far we've looked at the eligibility of people to vote, the eligibility of people to be voted. Now um, it's uh, appropriate to then discuss the actual process of um, determining the winner in the Senate and the House of Representatives and also in the state system as well. I'll start with the House of Representatives in the Federal Parliament. Now uh, both systems by the way, both houses are elected using uh, what we call preferential voting and that uh, and a, a voter will state each of the persons running in that particular um, election, number them from most preferred to least preferred, with the idea being that um, a person needs to receive an absolute majority. And if after the first preferences are looked at, a person hasn't received an absolute majority, then the usually the lowest candidate uh, is removed, and then they recalculate the thing again. And they, they keep doing this, removing the last um, the least popular person or the person who's received the least number of votes until essentially you're left with, with just two candidates left. Now there have been some changes in the 2016 election where the uh, original method of doing preferential voting which had to number all the candidates if you voted above the line or you could vote below the line for a run, uh, particular parties and they would determine the preferences that were most appropriate for them. Um, the most recent amendments to the Act have uh, actually moved the essentially strict preferential voting system to, um, to be more in line with uh, several of the other states, including Queensland, where it's optional. 
you can, under this optional system, rank every single candidate in order, or you can just um, just rank one, two, three, as many as you like, uh, and then leave the others blank. One of the, I guess, the quirks of that system is to do with the reallocation of preferences, particularly for those in, in minor parties. Um, often deals can be done between those um, minor parties and, and the larger ones in order to allocate uh, preferences one way or the other. Now, um, much, much, much simpler way of running elections is this uh, first-past-the-post system, as they have had in the United Kingdom, whereby in each electorate an approximately similar number of electors, and simply they just look at the candidate who receives the most number of votes. There's no preference in terms of candidates, it's just winner takes all. Now, the Senate and, and the ACT as well uses a, a proportional preferential voting system so that preferences are still used when uh, electing Senate candidates and as I mentioned earlier in this uh, recording uh, I, in the state of Queensland there were 122 candidates for the Senate and uh, in theory a person could number from 1 all the way through to 122 in the process of voting which incidentally takes a very very long time now, determining whether a particular candidate gets into the Senate or not, um, that candidate needs to gain what's called a quota. In other words, a, a fraction, certain fraction of all of the votes cast in that particular election. One of the consequences of having quite a complex system um, for doing these Senate votes is that the process of counting for the Senate takes a lot, lot longer, um, and that often the lower house uh, members are often aware of whether they've won or lost quite um, quite readily, quite rapidly, uh, where the Senate can take a lot longer. Although the, these days all of these systems are computerised and so those times, both lead times, uh, have got smaller. Now, other, um, other nations and systems use uh, forms of proportional representation. Um, mixed member systems, so Germany and New Zealand, have a combination of local uh, candidates and list candidates so that um, New Zealand, for example, has approximately 60 electorates um, and a certain number of reserved uh, Maori seats. And the basic electors have the option of, well, they can vote for both the local candidate and for a particular party uh, list. This can be quirky in some situations where a particular party can win uh, a few seats but very few votes or uh, vice versa, a party can win a, a reasonable percentage of the vote, a sort of 4% of the nation's vote, but fail to win any seats. And just by the quirk of that legislation, then they don't receive the first lot. Once you win the local seats, will be represented in Parliament, whereas the second uh, will not. And finally, I'll turn to the electoral college system that's used in the United States to elect their president. There, um, essentially, each state has a, a number of of electors, so that rather than people voting for the president directly, you actually are voting for electors in uh, the state in which you vote, and, and then it's it's actually a winner takes all system. So, for example, uh, famously in Florida, the where a lot of people reside, it has a lot of electoral college votes, and so as a result, the these populous swing states get a lot of attention in the U.S. presidential elections, whereas at the smaller states. Um, Alaska, North Dakota and places like that are simply not worth um, people ca um, campaigning in at all. And in many ways that exacerbates the, uh, the point made in the opening slide about people in marginal seats in both the US and Australia and elsewhere where um, get a disproportionate amount of attention from uh, parties competing to win uh, elections. Certainly in recent times the federal seat of Herbert in, in Townsville, where um, uh, the Townsville campus of James Cook University is located, has had a lot of attention from both parties and uh, as a result, um, for better or for worse, very large electoral promises. Um, the most, uh, the 2016 election, uh, $100 million to build uh, a new stadium for the Cowboys uh, were mooted by both parties, um, essentially to try and woo voters to their, to their side. And look, it's again, it's another important consideration in terms of this, the undermining 
of the democratic system, which really is meant to, to represent one vote, one person. But it, in practice, um, the votes are more valuable to, go, uh, to parties trying to form governments if they come from these very, very marginal seats. And finally, I'll just turn to the, uh, the issue of um, representative democracy, that idea that parliament is meant to uh, represent uh, society, the people, it's, and express the will of the people in lawmaking. Uh, however, the, when the makeup of parliament, when one uh, examines the underlying ethnic, gender, and wealth divisions, you, you see some quite stark contrasts between uh, the makeup of the Australian population and the makeup in parliament. And it is something that has started to change over time, but certainly ethnic minorities and um, indigenous people are underrepresented in parliament, as are women, as are people from low and middle socioeconomic groups. Now, arguably, it's not, um, it's not quite as problematic and as pronounced as, um, for, say, for example, judges on the High Court of Australia. But it's still nonetheless an important consideration to think about, in particular when we think about uh, the voting system and sort of future avenues of reform. And so I, I think it's worthwhile to leave with um, to this passing thought that there is a disproportionately high number of persons in Parliament who have structured legal training and education. And is that something which is good. Is that a good thing to have people who have this legal background when they're in that, um, the position to be in the supreme lawmaking body? Or should it more accurately reflect people uh, across society of which far, far, far fewer have this form of legal training? Something to think about.